we are good. Um, uh, that was a talk, the title I originally gave, and <clears throat> as I was sitting in the conference, kind of thinking about things, I thought maybe I'll make it a little bit broader. Um, also, because I never quite know exactly what Yakir will talk about, so I have strategies for covering all possibilities when I follow him in a talk. <clears throat> so, um, I, I first of all just want to thank uh, the Fetzer Foundation uh, for almost a whole lifetime of support. I grew up uh, <clears throat> basically right next door, and um, they gave me a grant, I forget, maybe somebody remembers, but I think it was like $15,000 or something. When I was a first year graduate student, Yakir had selected me to do <clears throat> my PhD with him, and he didn't have any money. Um, and so <clears throat> the Petzer Foundation gave me the $15,000, and that's what allowed me to do my, my PhD with Yakir. And I have to confess, I spent a couple hundred bucks, maybe 200 bucks, uh, to go to the first Tucson Conference on, on Consciousness. And <clears throat> we, uh, Roger and, and Chalmers and Stuart Hameroff and so on and so forth, we took a vacation afterwards. And uh, we hiked the entire Grand Canyon. And <clears throat> Roger and I, his wife Vanessa, I think he didn't have a single moment of peace because we, we just, well, you know what happens when you get a first year graduate student together with somebody like Roger. And I'm told that was sort of the origin of a lot of things that they were doing together. So anyway, thank you very much. And, and um, I thought I would focus a little bit on <clears throat> what the $15,000 uh, bought the Fetzer Foundation. So <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of keep coming back to that. OK, let's see if we can get this thing to work. So one thing, oh, by the way, I was very inspired by your cool graphics. So I'm upping my graphics in this, uh, in this talk. So one of the main messages that I want to use uh, to communicate is sort of the methodology that, well, most uh, theoretical physicists use, um, and certainly I use throughout my PhD piece, thesis. But the question was, how do we stay within conventional science and find just the right areas in the boundary between conventional and, and, uh, and meta-science or philosophy? How do we find just those right areas where we can maybe start to uh, uh, break, break through it, right? We want to expand the region, hopefully, of what you might consider to be conventional science. And most such attempts uh, are not successful. You know? uh, but occasionally, you, <clears throat> you are able to formulate the problem just the right way. You have a eureka moment and a ha. A ha means. In my, from my perspective, aha means aharono's helpful advances. Um, and, uh, and that's really what the Gedanken experiment methodology uses. So <clears throat> that's what we've been doing. And of course, ultimately, the, the, the goal is that you make a crack in that uh, impenetrable wall between what's conventional science and what's meta science or philosophy. <clears throat> Looking over, above, OK, it gets a little complicated. Uh, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you get to this, which is expanding the region of acceptable science, and <clears throat> eventually it gets funded, and hooray, that's, that's, that's how we do this. Okay, that's, that's all we got to do now. So I first wanted to address a little bit the question that Jan started the whole conference with, <clears throat> which is the idea of studying emergent quantum mechanics, where he defined emergence from the perspective of a deeper theory. Right, so we know we have non-relativistic quantum mechanics, most successful theory in history. And we'd like to know, perhaps, what's deeper than that. And so the way our group likes to do it is we investigate the deeper axioms of the theory. So perhaps uh, if we find out what the deeper axioms are, and at some point, we gain some evidence that <clears throat> non-relativistic quantum mechanics is not correct. Perhaps by having a deeper insight into those axioms, we'll learn how to modify the theory. Anyway, that's the philosophy. <clears throat> so by analogy, um, we can look at how we understand relativity. So you might ask, what's so special about relativity? And the, ax the answer is that the axioms, the very simple axioms that go into it, almost contradict each other. So we have uh, uh, an axiom concerning inertial frames. 
we have an axiom concerning the constant speed of light. And these, you know, these are almost at odds with each, with each other. But when you try to make them play nicely together, you see there is a region that they play nice and that basically you can derive the more complicated aspects of special relativity from that. So the question is, can we do something like that for quantum? <clears throat> and this is something that you care I, th I think has driven his life, this question, and also uh, the second reader in my thesis, Abner Shimoni. They were wondering <clears throat> if uh, similarly quantum mechanics might reconcile two axioms that virtually contradict each, contradict each other. <clears throat> so one is, of course, non-locality, and the other is causality, no signaling. Um, and um, so we know a little bit about that, but a lot of research has happened in the last couple decades on the question, of, can we use those to derive at least maybe part of quantum mechanics? And um, Ikir has always uh, guided his, uh, his students that uh, uncertainty is, is a fundamental axiom, right? This is somehow in there that the, the quantum mechanics should include the uncertainty. Is, is, is ontic. And so we'll, do some, we'll try to do something similar to what we did with special relativity and see how these almost incompatible, seemingly almost incompatible axioms, you know, non-locality, things seem connected uh, in a way that, you know, you would naively think you could violate causality or do fast and light signaling, but you can't. But in order to, the question is, by getting those axioms to play nicely with each other, how much of quantum mechanics can we actually drive? And so the traditional way we're taught about the axioms of quantum mechanics is <clears throat> we're taught that the, the uncertainty of quantum mechanics is the real the deep thing, you know? Stuff happens, uh, uh, nature is capricious. And then we, we see the, the non-locality, and we see causality. And Abner, uh, you remember his peaceful coexistence sign he would always use. So uh, <clears throat> somehow, uh, as a derivative concept, as a, as a, not at such, at such a deep level as the uncertainty, and it was uncertainty, it was the deepest level, but as a derivative level, we would see that non-locality is peacefully coexists with the uh, causality. And that's not been uh, Yakir's approach. Um, he's uh, kind of flipped it on its head Oh, it worked, okay. So from his perspective, the deepest is causality, relativity, no signaling, and non-locality. And one of the themes that he's been exploring throughout his career is can we derive from those deeper axioms the seemingly capriciousness of quantum mechanics, the playing of dice, the uncertainty. And <clears throat> that theme has been popping up all over the place. So there's a basic idea, <clears throat> that's the, new approach, axiomatic approach, and the idea is will that, you know, if it ever uh, happens that we discover that, that quantum mechanics is not correct, could this rearrangement of the axioms be a better guide to what's the new theory? Now, uh, there's actually, uh, so how much of quantum mechanics can we derive from those two axioms, non-locality and relativity or causality? But there actually are multiple things that we mean by non-locality. Hopefully, in Yakir's talk, you got a little flavor of that. Um, <clears throat> and there's also a variety of things even that no signaling or relativity might mean. So, <clears throat> of course, we, we know very much uh, about non-local correlations, EPR, so on and so forth. But Yakir just told you uh, about non-local equations of motion, and that came about originally from Yakir's attempt to understand the AB effect. And the actual quantity that is exchanged non-locally are these things that he was just showing you called the modular variables. And those obey non-local equations of motion. And <clears throat> what does no signaling mean? Well, what is that no signaling in the limit of you know, C going to infinity? So just you know, nothing's going backwards in time. So no information is going backwards in time. Um, and so, uh, so at the, for the, this, this first part of the talk, 
I just want to focus on non-local correlations. And I want to focus on the simple case of no signaling at any speed. Let's just not even, uh, don't consider uh, the issue of, the, the, of C. And so one of the really beautiful things that happened very early on is, is Yakir was asking that question, is Abner was asking that question. Um, uh, Sandu and, and, and Danny uh, wrote this beautiful paper honoring Abner in which <clears throat> they were able to show that uh, by creating a generalization of the clauser horn shimoni holt inequality, be able to, you know, they created a, qu a quantitative measure of, of uh, measure of, of, of non-local correlations called the uh, super quantum correlations. They're able to show that those two principles don't quite give you the whole uh, structure of quantum mechanics because <clears throat> they were able to see that if the blue ellipse here is quantum mechanics, uh, you could still have hypothetical uh, theories of nature that aren't what we know, right? The blue one is just quantum mechanics. The green is something beyond quantum mechanics. But we see that uh, you can have a much stronger, uh, basically these super quantum correlations, much stronger clauser horn shimoni holt uh, uh, correlations, yet that doesn't signal. And so uh, there's been immense, I don't know how many people, how many people here follow the Popescu Wurlich box literature? A uh, few of you? Okay. Well, this has been like an uh, unbelievably prolific, um, interesting area. So, uh, so many discoveries come out of this investigation of what's you know, not reality, right? So the interesting question is uh, you know, investigating reality and trying to see how we cross this line, right? How do you go across the line of, that's basically, you know, Clauser, Horn, Money Hold, uh, two root two. And, um, and like I said, there's huge numbers of results that came as a result of that. And maybe that's one way you could address Jan's question. You see theories that are not reality yet, but you get some insight in going beyond what is standard quantum mechanics. Maybe you get some insight in some other things. So, <clears throat> uh, for example, when people studied uh, results in the green region, or even papers that were making statements about what a quantum theory of gravity would have to look like. It was incredibly rich uh, research. Anyway, um, I'm not going any more into that right now. What I want to do right now, and for the rest of the talk, is just deal with standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We're not, we're not gonna make any change, not a single iota change to it. Um, but we're gonna deal with some reformulations of the theory, right? We're gonna make sure that Whatever we do, however we reformulate it, however we reinterpret it, the predictions of the reinterpretation of the reformulation will be exactly the same as standard quantum mechanics. But the concepts that will go into that, that reformulation will be radically different. You saw one example of it in Yukir's talk. So again, if we ever discover that we need to get rid of quantum mechanics, we have some empirical evidence that it's not correct, then maybe one of those reformulations with the completely different conceptual structures would be relevant. So that's basically what we wanted, I want to do now. <clears throat> and so I also get back to some of the early talks. I think it was uh, Basil's talk. Um, he was talking about uh, <clears throat> Bohm's notion of holism and very uh, uh, extraordinary thoughts he had about the relationships between parts and holes. And so he liked to use this analogy of the hologram, <clears throat> as you all know, um, and there's some things uh, which I'll just briefly touch on, um, which uh, nudge this a little bit, a little bit more, a little more fully, or a little bit further. So there's EPR, the uh, 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 Aron of Bohm effect. There's uh, the quantum pigeonhole effect, which you heard a little bit about, which is coming uh, a bit more. And there's something I'm going to talk a little bit more today. We got to come up with a better thing term for it, but in my, my thesis, I call it the, my PhD thesis, I call it the atom holism, but so we'll go into this a little bit. So for this part of the talk, what's central to all of these new effects, which are nudging this whole issue of the relationship between parts and holes is time, all right? So 
we're going to deal with some reformulations of quantum mechanics and the subject of, of time, actually. So <clears throat> again, getting back to our restructuring of the axioms, um, we're no longer going to talk about non-local correlations. Um, Nikir briefly spoke about uh, non-local equations of motion. And maybe I'll just, if you want, I'll just, well, I don't know if I have time, but I'll just do a couple of slides really quickly to uh, sort of reemphasize uh, Yakir's point. And the first thing I want to say is that those discoveries um, really, uh, again, we're, we're sticking with non the standard quantum mechanics, but the thing that led to those revolutions was challenging what you mean by uh, measurement, right? What is, it, you know, the von Neumann ideal measurement is almost like uh, assumed in a, the structure of the theory. We say, oh, the only way of getting good information is use the von Neumann ideal measurement. So that's not necessarily the best way to go. So here we have poor wave function on the psychiatrist's couch and doing some psychotherapy. <clears throat> and here the hammer is a von Neumann ideal measurement. That's the way we're taught to do it. But you here came up with weak measurement. Does that tell us something new about quantum mechanics? And in the last talk, you even heard about uh, looking at something in the, the Heisenberg picture, right? Here's wave function, here's Heisenberg, a little Picasso-ish and Schrodinger, a little, well, okay, realist. Um, does one tell you something different? And the big thing that Yukira just told you is that if you do, if you look at the famous double slit experiment, and suppose you want to believe in particles, all right? We, let's, let's try that. We believe in particles. Uh, so if you have a particle and you open and close one slit, how do you explain what happens later on in the, in the, the change, in the, uh, whoops, the, change in, the, in the interference pattern, right? Oh, OK. And for all of you who know that new Feynman, he was uh, famous for saying, nobody knows how it can be like that, and if you got him, if you had a beer with them or something, you'd say, forget it, nobody will ever understand that ever. So. Uh, so we all know that classical physics is, the equations of motion of class, classical physics are local, right? If you understand the force on a planet, mm -hmm. you look at the local derivative of the potential where the planet is, right? That's local uh, equation of motion in classical physics. Sorry? Oh, uh, Nicola, say it one more time. What was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Forgetting the, the uh, okay, forgetting for the moment. Thank you. Good point. Okay, but, uh, okay, there's a question about, I agree with you. I agree. <laughs> but in, in, in general, when you look at the equations of motion in classical physics, you look at the Poisson bracket, you have a DV, DVDR right there. Okay, so, <clears throat> and this is a, a nice paper I recommend by Tadamur and, and, and Batalan, I think. Herman is here somewhere, uh, <coughs> and addresses this, this topic a little bit. And here we see what motivated this new approach was the, the Harman and Bohm effect. Here you have a situation where there's no region inside the shielded, there's no field inside the shielded region. And <coughs> here we have a field inside the shielded region. And of course, you can see there's a difference in the interference pattern with that thing. And so you here didn't. Like he wanted to have a one-to-one -one relation between every element of the theory and what you could measure in principle, right? So he didn't uh, reify the potentials, the vector potential. He believed that you know the, the field is something we can really measure, and so this is where he created this non-local, uh, this non-locality in the equation of motion. Again, this is just using standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics. It's really just sitting there right in your face um, that the equation of motion. Are, have, are so dramatically different from classical physics. It's not a DV, DVDR. And this is part of what Ikir was, was just trying to tell you. Um, in the intermediate, so one particle, right? It's in a superposition of, in the one-dimensional case, he was just telling you at the end, one particle superposition of a wave packet going to the left, I'm oh, sorry, going to the right and going to the left. And that one particle is going to uh, interfere with itself, so to speak. Um, and so that's the pre-selection. C is the post-selection. The post-selection is in just one of the de detectors, D, right? Uh, D green, <laughs> sorry. I should change that in the paper. 
uh, D green uh, goes, or detector green uh, sees the particle, and that means that the preselected information is, a, is, a, is in a superposition of going both ways in this one dimension, but the post-selected information is that it was basically only going in this path, right? So, um, is that 20 minutes? Okay. Um, and um, anyway, so that's the setup. Uh, the new measurement that uh, came into focus here was, uh, you could didn't really mention it very much, but it's the idea of what kind of a, what can you observe of a single particle that doesn't disturb the particle, right? What's, what's the set of measurements that don't disturb it? So we call that the set of deterministic operators. It has a kind of a geometry associated with it, very beautiful geometry, which I don't have time to go into. But anyway, <clears throat> so uh, that was this paper. So to make a long story short, it was a time-symmetric interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, it doesn't stem from the wave particles, array properties of the particle. Um, it talks about an ontology of individual particles, right? But those individual particles obey non-local equations of motion. And we think about the properties that are deterministic for those individual uh, particles. It's called the, the deterministic set of operators. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so that suggests the Heisenberg approach to the, the basic ontology, sort of a process-based uh, approach as opposed to a you know, Schrodinger fluid, fluidy approach. Um, <clears throat> so again, the particle goes to one of the slits, but obeys non-local equations of motion. And there's a lot of other very interesting things we could say about this, new ways of thinking about uncertainty relations and commutation relations and so on and so forth, but we don't have time to go into that. Okay, <clears throat> one other thing that comes from this rearrangement of the axioms. Now I want to talk about uh, the kind of non-locality that has to do with time, non-locality and time. Um, I'm going to kind of go more quickly. So it starts here. Mm. It starts with um, how is it that we have two identical atoms. The first atom decays after one minute. The second atom decays after one hour. There's nothing, uh, there was nothing, whoops, sorry. There was nothing that uh, suggested they were different in the beginning, yet they behave completely different later on. And so this was the start. This is uh, a famous paper um, by Aharon of Bergman and Lebowitz in 1964. Um, we know that in classical physics, if we know the initial conditions and we know all the interactions, well, in general, you know, forgetting about chaos and things like that, the final uh, bounding conditions are set. Quantum mechanics is not like that. So this, is, this was the ABL sort of three stage, three-step paradigm uh, approach. So you have an initial state, psi, you have some interaction, you're asking some question, measuring observable C, and you have a post-selection, phi. And so this led to this approach that sometimes referred to as two-vector theory, time-symmetric uh, reformulation of quantum mechanics. Again, it's just, it's just another way of looking at standard non, uh, a standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics. There's actually, there's no way of saying that this view is false and the standard approach to uh, non-relative quantum mechanics is correct or vice versa for that matter, right? They're just, one is a reformulation of the other. But that's the basic picture. And you probably have all seen um, the, what it means by weak measurements. So we have the pre-selection and the weak measurement and the intermediate time and then a post-selection, which is another regular ideal measurement. And you collect the results of the weak measurements and that's where we get all these interesting new, uh, new phenomena. So one, uh, I'll just mention really quickly, this is also the, I'm just trying to tell the FETS organization what they got for the $15,000. This is in my PhD thesis as well. It's very, all these, I, I invented this category that I called quantum miracles. Maybe Yakir gave me that, that word. But the, the idea was, here are seemingly impossible things that you can do with two vectors that it's really hard to figure out how you could possibly uh, Jerry rig it to do it with one vector. And so one was a uh, the Cheshire cat separating a particle from its properties. We did some experiments to test that. That was very nice. There was another one that you've heard a little bit about called the, the quantum pigeonhole effect. And here we have some pigeons or whatever they are, right? <laughs> the ontological question is, are they pigeons or are they not pigeons? But <clears throat> that was another example of something seemingly impossible. I want to just mention that. <clears throat> uh, something that hasn't really been 
people haven't picked up on in the, the quantum pigeonhole um, effect. It really gives you a completely different way of thinking about um, uh, non-local correlations. It's really, we have a section in that paper where we show that it's actually complementary to EPR. So, and this is a beautiful, I think Anil is in the audience somewhere. He writes often for other, oh, hey Anil. Uh, he wrote a beautiful article about this, so I'm just, I'm quoting a, one of his lines in, in his beautiful article. Um, so, the, my last part, which I think I have a few minutes for, I just want to, there's something interesting you can say about uh, this whole business of, of reductionism. And you probably all, well, we've all been, uh, this is how we're all trained as, as scientists. This is very good, uh, seems to work very well so far. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not knocking it down, but I'm just saying there's some uh, com uh, interesting new things we can say. So <clears throat> here's the usual, this is uh, Jan and Gerhard's picture, which you, know, you start off with the local uh, microscopics, and that's where all the causal powers are, right, in the microscopic world, and you uh, build up into more uh, levels of complexity, and you get uh, emergent macroscopic structures. Um, and one of the nicest examples of the possible idea of emergence and the notion of top-down causation comes from entanglement. And I, I remember many interactions with Abner about this question, and he would always uh, he would say, well, eh, entanglement has a little bit of that, but not, you know, don't get too carried away, right? It's still very fully reductionistic, um, but it gives you a little bit of a glimpse of it. Um, I'm going to uh, skip through, but now we have an example. Okay, I'm going to skip through more quickly because I'm running out of time. So now we have an example um, also for $15,000 on my PhD thesis, um, in which we were analyzing the Hardy paradox, right? And, you know, this is kind of a, originally it was formulated as a no-go theorem. And um, one of the results you can see here is if you ask the number of particles in the outer paths, you see that there are zero particles there as in, when you look at them individually, nevertheless, uh, those uh, non-particles interact with each other. So, um, and also, uh, I think Michael Brooks is here as well. Thank you, Michael. Uh, he wrote some, a beautiful article on this in New Scientist. Um, so, to, to make a long story short, we see that if you measure weakly the number of, the number of electrons in the outside path, not an overlapping path, we see there's no electron there. Similarly, <clears throat> for the positron and the non overlapping, but nevertheless, there's minus one pair of, of particles there. So here's a situation where uh, there's a property of the whole, you know, when you're measuring the, the product of those observables, um, and they are radiating to uh, the properties of the part. In some sense, there's no part, right? <laughs> there's no particle in the parts, but there is a whole. And um, so this is kind of like uh, the notion of top-down causation. And this generalizes very nicely. Uh, I won't go into all the details. I'm going to have to skip over this, but um, basically I can arrange a situation where I have, say, three boxes, right? Famous, we'll start with Lev's three boxes. Um, three boxes and three particles. If I measure any one box, nothing, right? Not, no particle there. If I measure any two boxes, no particle. But only when I couple to the three of them, suddenly we see there's a particle in each box. So in some sense, this is a hole without parts. And um, I'll have to skip over this because I think that was the, the, okay, that was the, that was the bell. Um, <clears throat> so it's, basically you won't find any subpart of these systems that has any measurable consequences. No correlations, no two particle correlations, nothing. No particles, no, doesn't matter what you couple to, it's not there. Only when you couple to the hole, you start seeing that, uh, the, the whole sort of radiates down to the parts. Um, and you can do this with uh, atoms. You can have atoms that behave perfectly normally like atoms do. They have the right spectrum that you would expect. But if you try to look at, if you try to find the electrons or the uh, protons, you'll never see anything. So um, it's a very uh, general idea. Last slide. Um, this is uh, uh, some papers that we have that give a whole new kind of approach to how you think about the laws of physics. And this is one way you can rethink about EPR. 
And that's it. Um, I just want to point to, we have a, a journal called Quantum Studies. I encourage you all to, um, to submit your papers to it. We're doing, having a nice job, and you're some of the members of our institute. So thank you very much. <laughs>